Well, welcome everybody. Sorry we're a few minutes late. I would like to introduce Dr. Diva from Australia and Robin, and Robin Smith, also from Australia. And they're here to discuss um, their breast implant research. And we'll just, if everyone would just put their questions in the Q&A, that would be, or excuse me, put your questions in the comments, then we can have a Q&A at the end. But we have uh, Dr. Diva, he presented at the summit this past year, um, in 2022, actually, and um, he's going to update us on some pretty significant research coming out of Australia, which I think we'll all be very interested in. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for this kind invitation. And it's morning over here. Uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge also Robin, who's uh, with me as well. Rob, a lot of this research I'm about to present is pretty much the product of Robin's determination and hard work. So without her, um, you know, we wouldn't have got this far. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and share my screen. And uh, what I want to take uh, through today, you all today, is the results of the work we're doing here in Australia. I'm really indebted to our, our partners, and it's a true collaboration between academics like myself, clinicians, our society here, uh, and it's actually an international collaboration with input from uh, Leeds Beckett University as well. So this is taken from a paper we wrote a few years back when um, women started to present with uh, systemic symptoms and sort of ended up in our offices. And I think it's good to put things in perspective. Um, having researched breast implants for 20 years now, um, I deal with a lot of, of problems that result from implants and it's always nice if you can have a biological framework to put things in. So an implant goes in, it can be a textured implant or a smooth implant, and then something either on the implant or in the implant or growing on the implant then triggers inflammation. Uh, my wife is an immunologist, so um, I've learned through her a little bit about the immune system. And we kind of have two systems, right? So the innate system is kind of our dumb immunity. Uh, it, we share it with, you know, early uh, life forms on this planet. And essentially what the innate system does is whenever something foreign or um, st uh, stimulatory comes into contact with it, uh, the macrophage is the, the main cell, they go crazy and they, they pour out uh, inflammatory cytokines. And that just simply causes destruction. It's a very... Um, uh, unregulated and, and sometimes uh, effect, but effective because essentially everything dies. And the end point of that, particularly if the innate system is out of control, is inflammation and fibrosis. So you get thickening of the tissues, collagen being laid down, almost like scar tissue forming. Uh, um, the adapter system is a smart system. So our TNB cells uh, are able to um, recognize certain uh, antigens, um, inflammatory stimuli, and not only recognize them, but remember them. So the second time these things come, uh, uh, adaptive immune system kicks into play and it's like a surgical strike. You know, you basically um, get rid of whatever it is quickly and effectively. Now the immune system is our protector, but it can also become our enemy. And so as the immune system becomes amplified, you can get an exaggerated immune response. Uh, and this is where, when we know from studies of other diseases where the immune system's out of control, that certain patterns of diseases emerge. And this is where it, it becomes interesting. So inflammation and fibrosis, of course, we see with capsular contracture. That's the first thing I studied, you know, when I became interested in, in what implants do. Um, the immune system that's out of control can lead to autoimmune disease as well. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously uh, SSBI or BII is, is been potentially linked to autoimmune disease. It can, of course, uh, T cells and B cells can transform into lymphoma. Here we have BIA or CL. And of course, the immune system out of control uh, can lead to allergy. So suddenly, as we start to look at biology and look at the immune system, these sort of three out of the four uh, diseases of an exaggerated immune response seem to be um, uh, associated with breast implants. So that triggered in me a, a kind of cu curiosity. And people that know me well, it's when I become very curious and I become very determined because, you know, want to know answers to these questions. That led to the a study that we set up now, gosh, what, three years ago, Robert, um, where we started to recruit women with what we now term, I think better terms, systemic symptoms associated with breast implants, SSBI. And we can talk a bit about the terminology, but I think as a scientist, it's best to stick to um, dis, you know, a proper description rather than attribute causation at this early stage. So 
you know, SSBI is not a new term. The TGA have used it. Our regulator uses it. Uh, the FDA used it in some of their documentation. And so I think uh, my preference, um, at least for the research side, is to use the term SSBI. So here's the study. Women with uh, systemic symptoms present to our clinic. We um, really important, I think, first step is to uh, examine the patient, take their history, you know, all the good stuff that you learn in medical school. Uh, and if, if required, image the implants, because sometimes implants are ruptured or there's some implant associated disease that needs to be sorted out. We do do an extensive workup of uh, bloods because a lot of the systemic symptoms uh, can be associated with other, other diseases, so things like thyroid deficiency, iron deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. And really what we don't want to do is, is miss those things because some of those things need to be addressed and treated. And then all women uh, presenting to the study do get uh, serum inflammatory markers. Um, I'll go into that a little bit when the, with the biological data. And they are worked up for autoimmune disease as well. So, uh, so um, you know, we, we do occasionally throw up uh, people with positive ANA rheumatoid factor and, and then they need to obviously go and see an immunologist. Um, the patients with uh, systemic symptoms that proceed to explant, uh, we then have a wealth of biological data. So our laboratory here looks at the implant, the capsule, uh, and looks at histology, microbiology, etc. So it, it, it's really nice to correlate uh, symptoms, uh, biological data. And then, of course, this is Robin's uh, job, you know, two years of following up, um, checking to see what happens to these women after uh, they've had an implant and capsulectomy. Now, of course, we want to compare these women to control women, so women who present for explants without any symptoms, just to see uh, what differences we find. So that, in, a set, in essence, is what we've been up to for the last uh, few years, obviously impacted slightly by the pandemic, but nevertheless doggedly determined to, pers to, uh, to persist and continue. This is uh, the way we've structured, because, you know, with SSBI, women present with such a wide range of symptoms. And so once again, to put some structure into it so we could look at um, analysing it, what we did was we created this uh, symptom tracker and uh, essentially uh, we looked at each of the body systems, nervous system, immune inflammatory, uh, integument, uh, skin and hair. Uh, and, and listed here are tick boxes of the commonest symptoms. Uh, now, to make this this box, you know, simply was initially looking at all the symptoms and putting them into common, the, the, the commonest ones we see. Now, there is a second page where if these symptoms are not listed. Women can actually list extra symptoms as well. So we want to try and capture as much of the of the data as we can. We also included uh, in this a severity score because it's really important not to say what symptoms you have and also when they started, but what sort of impact they're having um, on women and their lifestyle. So the scale is pretty simple. It's just a, a, a numeric scale going from one mild or intermittent with little or no impact to five, which is you know, severe and obviously impacting every day uh, of their lives. And so this allows us then to, to uh, codify the data and, and subject it to statistics and analysis. Now, this is something that's no surprise uh, to you at all. I've been talking about this for some time. Um, so for SSBI, I think um, the term on block I don't think is relevant. Now that might be controversial to some people, but you know I do on block surgery for cancer. So I, I've treated ALCL. I've, I've treated tumors invading into the jaw. And and for cancer surgery, the term on block is a very specific term. It's it's used where you actually are removing normal tissue as a cuff around the cancer. You don't want to actually cut into the cancer. And if the cancer is attached to bone or chest wall, you need to remove a portion of the chest wall. Uh, ensuring that the, the, the tumour, the cancer, the invasive tumour is completely excised. So that term on block, I think, has been misused in SSBI. And so this is the terminology, once again, to make it more scientific and accurate, uh, is what we suggest. A total capsulectomy, you can see on these slides, can be done in two ways. So this is these are two operations that I've done. This is a total capsulectomy, but the implant is in situ, right? So the implant is, is enclosed. Um, this is what some people might term an on block, but I, I say better to call it total capsulectomy with an implant in situ. And here in this bottom photograph, it's the same operation. It's still a total capsulectomy. You see the capsule has been completely removed. But in this case, uh, it was difficult to do a total capsulectomy with the implant in place because I couldn't see what was behind. And we were getting high up into the axilla. And in this case, you can make a capsulotomy, pull the implant out, and then go back and complete your total capsulectomy. So. Um, so I think that's it's a very clear term. Once again, it's very easy then to compare for statistics and data. What operation did you do? Did you do this? Did you do that? And then, of course, some women get a partial capsulectomy. 
Um, this is uh, only if the, the capsule is benign, so it's very thin, or if the capsule is, is fused and, and uh, attached to the chest wall, particularly around the ribs. And you can actually do some significant damage if you chase um, uh, some of these capsules, particularly if they appear benign. So the aim is always, uh, I think, to try and do a total capsulectomy if you can. But once again, like with all surgery, do not persist with something that's going to cause harm. First, do no harm. Um, I put this in um, capsulotomy, which is simply cutting a hole, a slit in the capsule, putting the implant out and leaving uh, the capsule behind. And some people sample the capsule. Um, we did not offer that procedure to women in the study. Um, and certainly the control women who are presenting with implant disease, i.e. rupture or Capcom, most of them proceeded to total capsulectomy for the same reasons. You don't want to leave a pathological capsule behind. So excitingly, here are the data. Uh, here's, here are the results. So we've had over 200 women now complete their first um, BI questionnaire. So these women are starting their, their journey towards explant. Some of these women don't go to explant, but it gives us a really good snapshot of what women present with in SSBI to our office. We've had now close to 80, probably now more, Robin, since um, we've updated the data who've hit the six month mark. And so we want to share some of those data with you. And, and as time goes on, we've seen we've got 18 at 12 months and these numbers will slowly grow. Um, now, we also have 49 women uh, that have uh, the control group. So they had implant removal capsulectomy, but had no systemic symptoms. So they had local implant complications. Uh, and it's these two groups, uh, the six month group and the, the control group that we compare to. When you look at our controls and our SSBI women, uh, you can see that they're essentially the same group in terms of age. They've all been exposed to implants around 10 or 11 years. In Australia, we use a lot of textured implants. So you see they predominate 62, 55%. We also use a lot of shaped implants uh, and round implants. And in Australia, we love silicon. So the majority of implants um, are silicon gel implants. We see some saline implants and some we, we weren't able to ascertain uh, what the fill was. And uh, un unsurprisingly, the control group had multiple previous surgeries. So often these women uh, who are eventually at the end of their life with implants are sick of them, they've had multiple complications and, and that's why they're getting rid of them, but with no systemic symptoms. When we look at the spread of local implant disease, once again, the groups are very, very similar. So this is important because when you're doing scientific comparison, you want to make sure you're comparing apples with apples. You're not um, looking at a group that say had got much more Capcom uh, or malposition or rupture. The rupture rates in the controls were higher than in the in the SSBI group. And once again, that's the reason why they were getting their implants removed. But seroma and visibility and rippling were essentially the same. So the groups were essentially comparable. So that's a, a good place to start. In terms of the types of implants, uh, reflecting a lot of other uh, studies, we're not seeing a particular brand of implant. The high rates of Allergan implants in Australia reflect the high rates of Allergan implants that went in about 10 years ago. So uh, there's no surprises that we're seeing SSBI in women with a variety of different uh, implant types, textures. Uh, this is just a shout out to our classification we published a few years back. We don't talk about particular brands of implants, we talk about grades of implants. So the highest grade in terms of surface area roughness and texture are the grade four implants. And of course, the smooth of the new uh, uh, Motiva implants are grade one. So essentially they're very slick and there's no a surface texture to them. And this has got relevance to ALCL. Uh, the higher the grade, the higher the risk of ALCL. Um, so here's our first graph uh, showing the difference between uh, before surgery and after surgery for our women with SSBI. And you can see a significant uh, drop in the number of symptoms from close to 20 down to about nine or 10, right? So the number of symptoms completely dropped. And you can see each of the body sy systems also significant drop. The only one that didn't change too much here in terms of symptom number was the gastrointestinal system. So that it could be that there's other things going on in the GI system, but certainly huge drops in, in, in uh, uh, neurological symptoms, specifically things like brain fog uh, as well. Here's our leaderboard. Uh, so you have um, uh, the top uh, the top five, uh, anxiety is the number one thing that women with SSBI present with. Uh, brain fog is the other one. Uh, but a lot of uh, muscle pain, chronic fatigue also feature in, in uh, the majority of women. And after six months, these women, uh, the really interesting thing is that anxiety drops to about 24%. And that, that essentially is a baseline anxiety level of women of, of that age, of this cohort. So it's almost therapeutic for anxiety, but also a lot of other things disappear. Brain fog doesn't appear in that list. 
neither does chronic fatigue. And some of these symptoms, even though they were still persistent, were not very severe, as you can see from this graph. So from an average severity of around three, so you can imagine this has got a moderate impact on people's life and, and activity and work, down to you know less than 1.5, where even if the symptoms were present, they really weren't interfering with your, your life and your activity. So to me, this is, I think, the first important point of the data and the research to date. There is absolutely no doubt that women uh, with SSBI have a benefit from capsulectomy and uh, removal of their implants. So I think those that still doubt that there's benefit, I think, uh, need to be pointed to this data. And it's not just our data, it's the data from the US, uh, multiple studies now, but the, the best studies are the ones like ours and the US study, which are prospective. So they're not looking backwards. They're enrolling these women you know, getting a snapshot of the symptoms before surgery and then following them up at six months, 12 months and 18 months. So really good to see uh, the fruit of our labours now on, on this graph um, to, to show that uh, there is benefit, not just in symptom number, but symptom severity. And that, that's really good news because uh, if I was presenting anything different, um, I would be a bit concerned I was doing an operation with, with no real merit or benefit. We looked at our controls and in this graph, sorry about the, uh, the the busyness of it, but let me point out that the orange colors, so this is uh, SSBI women uh, before surgery and at six months. And you can see for each of the systems, once again, you know this data already, significant drop in symptom number. Uh, and these are our control women. And what's really interesting here is that even without symptoms, women were reportedly feeling better. <laughs> Um, not significantly better, but better when their implants came out, probably because they were relieved that their, their local symptoms, uh, pain, etc., was was um, was better. This is really interesting. So the psychological uh, uh, symptoms that women suffer um, in terms of anxiety, depression, we, we specifically measured that. So this is baseline, and you can see that after removal in the SSBI group, it, it all matched. So. That to me is, is showing real benefit um, in terms of women being able to you know, move on and, and, and get on with their lives. Um, here's data that uh, is looking at uh, whether women had a total capsulectomy. Once again, using my uh, terminology, it doesn't matter if they were total with implant in situ versus total with implant removed first versus partial capsulectomy. And this is data that very much aligns with what um, the US group is showing. And in fact, there's been another study now out of the Netherlands that's shown exactly the same information in that the benefit, whether it's reduction in symptom number or severity is the same, whether you do a total capsulectomy or a partial capsulectomy. And you look, this is, to me, this is actually good news. So whilst I'm not gonna go in with the aim of trying to do a partial capsulectomy, if for whatever reason, if halfway through the surgery, I'm, get, I'm beginning to start you know, to get worried, or I think I might be potentially causing more harm, I at least, uh, I'm, I'm uh, um, happy about the fact that we can still do a partial capsulectomy if needed and the benefit is still the same. So I think that's a better way of looking at it uh, rather than saying, okay, everyone has to have a total capsulectomy. But of course, it doesn't change the aim. So in women with SSBI, uh, when I'm talking to them, I'll say, look, my aim is always to try and give you a total capsulectomy. But if I can't, the good news is that, uh, you know, we can balance risk and benefit and the benefit is still there. So I think I want to spend a bit of time talking about, of course, there'll be questions about this, but but um, but nevertheless, that's kind of what I think the data is telling us. This is where it starts to get really interesting, right? So this is uh, this is all the blood workup. So we literally throw the book at, at these women and bleed them, the vampires come in and collect uh, tubes of blood before the surgery. Um, and essentially we look at a whole heap of things. And uh, the one thing that we found uh, that was raised, and not in, in all women, so in about half, less than half of these women, the bloods are completely normal. So there's nothing that lights up as abnormal. So that's also probably a good thing, but it also means that we're not dealing with thyroid deficiency, iron deficiency, or some other disease that needs to be addressed. But what we did find as a, as a signal was that the CRP, which is an inflammatory a marker of inflammation, was raised in around about 15%, 14% of women. And that's higher than what you would expect in that group. Now, what does that mean? We're not 100% sure, but at least it's a signal that going back to that initial hypothesis that inflammation may play some role. Um, so we're not saying it's de definitive, but if we found absolutely normal bloods in everyone, we'd say, okay, maybe inflammation doesn't play a role, but this is telling us that we need to look further. So Robert and I are looking at 
getting more grants and looking at uh, some government funding to look at the inflammatory markers in more detail. The CRP is a very um, non-specific marker of inflammation can be raised in a whole heap of conditions, but there are much more sensitive ways of measuring, measuring inflammatory markers in serum, things like proteomics. These cost a lot of money, but now with this pilot data or these, this not pilot data, but this important data that's coming out, it may be a springboard to getting some government funding and matched uh, partnership funding to look at this in more detail. And I'm, I'm certainly committed to that. When we looked at the, um, the capsules that we removed from women with SSBI and the controls, we found that um, uh, there were no significant differences. In fact, in the majority of women, there was um, a benign capsule. You can see in the controls here, over half of them had nothing. There was absolutely no inflammation, nothing. In SSBI, the number was lower, but there was not significant. Around 36, 37% of women, the, the capsule was sent off had, had nothing to see. We saw uh, a same degree of histological inflammation. So whether this was a lymphocytic in infiltrate or an acute inflammatory infiltrate, we saw the same uh, levels of foreign body infiltrates, so uh, the bits of silicon and, and foreign body reactions as well. Where we did see a difference, and, and this is still once again another signal that needs to be further looked at, was a thing called synovial metaplasia. Um, now, it, it, that refers to a change in the shape of the cells in the capsule. So things, the, the fibroblasts look a bit stretched and they look a bit strange. Now we are working with our pathologists here. So I know for metaplasia, once again, is a very non-specific term, but when you see a difference like this, it, it does require, you know, that curiosity wanting to go in and try and understand why that's the case. And so we're working to look at uh, these particular specimens, looking to see if, in fact, synovial metaplasia is a product of inflammation. It may be that we need to go back to the laboratory and subject some of these fibroblasts to various, you know, antigens and stimulants to see if that, in fact, is the end product, once again, of an immune system uh, that's out of control or inflammation. So you can see that um, there's a bit more work to do. Here's where it does get really interesting, excuse me. Um, and what we found here is that um, is that women with SSBI definitely had a significant increase in the number of recoverable bacteria. Um, so, you know, once again, people accuse me of my uh, research into implants of being very bacteria centric, but we've shown that bacterial growth can, can certainly cause capsular contracture. We do believe bacteria has a role to play in ALCL and transformation of lymphocytes. So it's no surprise that perhaps when you see inflammation at the core of implant disease that we're starting to see a signal like this. It is not a strong signal, so we're not seeing it 100% of women, so so yes, taken. Uh, and the reason why we're seeing this perhaps in, in contrast to the US studies, we're using slightly different methods. Having worked with bacteria for many, many years, um, you can almost use a, a too sensitive a test. So if you look for bacterial DNA or RNA bits of the fragments of their, their genetic code, you'll find bacteria everywhere. You'll find bacteria on my skin right now. You will find live bacteria on my skin, but you might find as, as a remnant as well. So the way we've done this study is that we take fresh uh, capsule. We did it yesterday in a couple of cases, and that goes into the lab as quickly as possible, uh, preferably you know within an hour. The, the uh, fresh tissue is vortex. So in other words, it's, it's the, the bacterial um, uh, proteins are uh, uh, fractured and then that's placed into an enrichment broth culture. So even low levels of bacteria are amplified. And what it means to me is if it's a positive on this test, then live bacteria are actually multiplying or growing or living on the capsule or the implant. And the bacteria we found, of course, no surprise, it's Staph epidermidis. This is a, a bacteria that lives within the breast and the breast ducts and C. acnes, Cuterobacterium acnes, which we also see in orthopedic infections, uh, joint infections. So these are two common culprits that we see. Uh, this is a, a parallel study. So, so what we've done is to get a, a whole picture of these SSBI women in partnership with the Leeds Beckett group, we, we invited women as part of the, the SSBI study to go really in depth into some of the psychological burden, the, the trauma that they've gone through. Uh, and, and this paper, I'm really indebted to uh, Georgina Jones and her team in terms of, of uh, the methods. I'm not a psychologist, and uh, please apo uh, apologies if um, if I if I uh, I'm not explaining this well enough. But so the, the aims of this uh, sub study were to understand the symptom experience, the illness narratives, uh, and the help-seeking behaviour in women living with SSBI. 
And we did this as a semi-structured uh, qualitative interviews um, using the McGill narrative method. So that's a, a standard way in which you can really get into, into depth in terms of what these women have gone through. Um, and then through these, we've completed 16 and there's another nine to go, I think, Robin, is that right? Uh, so the, the aim will we'll have 25 and then we'll write this up. But what, what, um, what they've found is that there's some common themes that are starting to emerge, right? So the first and, and most important is this common theme of disempowerment. So at the very moment women were contemplating uh, breast implants, whether it was for cosmetic surgery or for reconstruction, they felt that their choices were constrained. In other words, they were pushed a certain way, whether it was, uh, you know, pressure of needing to make a decision or pressure from people around them, but they didn't feel like they owned the decision to get the implants in the first place. Uh, and certainly once they had the surgery, um, it, they were kind of almost indifferent to it. It, it. Perhaps the result was not what they expected. And certainly once they started to develop systemic symptoms, the feeling of shame and guilt were amplified, perhaps by themselves or people around them. And they felt very alone when they went to, to try and work out what was going on. And, and of course, once you're, you're sick and, you, and people are saying, you know, there's nothing wrong, then you start to not trust yourself or your body and certainly not trust people around you. So mistrust is another big uh, theme that has been found through these interviews. One thing which is very, very uh, close to my heart, and, and I'm disappointed to to see that you know, a lot of the women we, in this study, we just published another study of women with implants that have come through to our implants uh, service here in Australia, were never actually informed of the risks of these devices. So there was there was never a conversation about the specific risks of breast implants, what could go wrong, you know, in five years, 10 years, 15 years. And, and to me, I think that's, that's a real failure of, of, of us as a profession, if, if women have implants in them and actually have no idea of, of the risks. So I'll talk a bit about what we're trying to do to fix that. And of course, when they go to their doctors or to back to their surgeons, they're dismissed. So I think that certainly adds to trauma and, and a feeling of mistrust. And subjected to surgical authority with decisions, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, so, so your breasts look great, you know, what are you worried about? So that's not the sort of way in which um, we should be dealing with, with SSBI. And of course, there's no doubt that uh, these women are grouped through social connections and they, they feel validated and that they, they find, um, you know, people that are going through the same thing. And there's a recovery of agency through that. So we, we have to understand that. But in essence, the interviews so far have shown that this pathway PAP starts right at the beginning and, and then as, as time goes on and they become sicker and sicker, it invokes suspicion, cynicism, mistrust of the healthcare system and not just the healthcare system but, but beyond. Here are some of the quotes. Now, I won't go through all of them um, and they've all been pseudonymized, so these are not the, the, the real names of the, of the women that have been interviewed. But, but I like the one in the middle, right? You know, it says, I went back to the surgeon who did them that's when he told me it was all in my head, the pandemic was making me paranoid. Now you can see that that is not a really helpful way of dealing with SSBI. So if nothing else, uh, I think this research has made me much more aware of, of my interaction with patients and it should make um, all of us as surgeons using implants aware of right at that first point of contact. Now, what are we trying to do here? Um, uh, in terms of making sure the woman has uh, complete control and empowerment in terms of her decision to proceed. So the conclusions that we found to date, and there's still a lot of work to do, is that uh, in Australia, we now have the largest group of women with SSBI and match control. So that's good. Thanks, Robin, for, for, your, for your help with that. Uh, like a lot of other studies around the world now, data is coalescing and, and there can be no argument that uh, women who undergo removal and capsulectomy have a significant reduction in their, both their symptom number and their severity. We've shown that at six months. The US study is now at 12 months and is showing persistent improvement. So that's excellent news. Uh, in, in our group, and this is also very good, there's back towards the psychological baseline anxiety and depression, which is good. Um, we've shown like the US study and, and now the study out of the Europe, there's no difference in terms of benefit versus a total versus a partial capsulectomy. Uh, I do believe and I'm committed to look further at the role of inflammation and infection. Uh, now how we do that is, is uh, remains to be seen, but we've certainly got some smart people around me here looking at uh, better methods and techniques. Uh, I will caution against uh, going too much into in vitro and animal data. I've done a lot of those studies myself. I think the best data actually comes from patients. So the more biological specimens we get, uh, the more access we have to serum, 
uh, uh, the better. Uh, and thankfully, we've got uh, many women uh, interested in enrolling in the study in Australia, so that's good. The, the psychological study, I think, is a really, really powerful and important study. Uh, and I think we need to look at not just what happens when women get sick, but what happens right at the beginning uh, when, when they start their, their relationship with their implants. And I do think that we, uh, as a health profession, have to listen to and validate SSBI, I think, uh, for too long. Uh, denial is actually not, not only supported by evidence, but it actually uh, harms and negatively uh, uh, impacts on women as well. So what do I think is going on? Well, I've put this slide together. It's been run through the rest of the research group. So uh, I think, you know, and this is still a hypothesis. We haven't, we haven't landed on, on proof yet, but this is what we're working on as a working hypothesis. So I feel that there are things that happen right at the beginning, whether it's disempowerment, constrained choices, or a failure to adequately inform women of the risks. They have their implants placed. And then there's this inflammation, mind, body sort of amplification amplification cycle it's hard to say actually <laughs> um, so the four factors that I think are all working in concert are underlying biological inflammation psychological impact and symptoms physical symptoms and then dismissal by profession and these things just go round and round and the only way to break that of course is to remove the implant and do a capsulectomy which now has data to support that it actually makes a difference so it, it, it's complex. It's not like research I've done before into ALCL and capsular contracture, where you're dealing with a black and white thing. You're dealing with a nebulous thing. You're dealing with multiple symptoms. But I think hopefully I've been able to uh, show you the way in which systematic uh, research, the way in which we, we take a mass of data and start to make a sense of it and, and, and at least try and analyze it and try and come up with meaningful uh, meaningful uh, solutions and answers for, for uh, uh, and ultimately affect practice. Um, this is kind of, I think, an important slide. So it, it doesn't apply just to breast implants, but all implants uh, generated through, of course, the, the mesh disaster that we're, we're facing all around the world in Australia as well, and, and the hip and knee joints, the metal on metal. So it's, it's not just breast implants, but all implants. And three things come together when an implant is put into a patient by a surgeon, right? So there's risks associated with the implant itself. You know, we saw with PIP implants, there was a manufacturing issue, which of course caused uh, horrendous harm. Uh, for patients, there are some patients that are genetically at risk. In ALCL, there's more evidence to show that the way your body deals with inflammation actually plays a role potentially in, in, in generating lymphoma. So we know that patients have some innate uh, factors that make them more predisposed towards disease. And of course, uh, here I am down here, the surgeon, right? So what are things that we can do today? Well, the same things we've been banging on for 20 years. Share the decision with your patient. Make sure that she's empowered to make the decision to have an implant, whatever it is. We are moving in Australia towards, particularly for cosmetic surgery, an initial psychological screening test, which I think is, is, a, is a great idea because if women are vulnerable, fragile, and have significant psychological issues, perhaps they shouldn't be going having cosmetic surgery at all. Uh, informed educated consent is something that Robert and I and a few of my colleagues here have worked on and we have a, a really good tool that's now being used in our state here and hopefully across Australia and it's available so if people want to read it uh, uh, there's a link to it I'll, I'll share with you. Empowering the patient obviously if you're a surgeon you need to know what you're doing you need to be properly trained uh, in the procedure so you don't cause harm. Uh, I do think all women with implants need lifelong surveillance I've practiced that for 23 years. So any woman I put an implant in, I see every year, if nothing else, just to catch up and get a bit older and wiser together. <laughs> but, but also I think for me to see your own results over 20 years makes you much more humble as a surgeon. You don't claim to be the best surgeon in the world if you see your own results and your implants change as women go through life, have babies, you know, go through menopause, etc. And of course, the catch up each year is important because any new data, any new findings like this can be shared directly from the doctor to the patient. Oh, by the way, this study is now published on ALCL. You know, don't worry, your implants are grade two, so your risk is this. You know, it forms a very, very nice link. Uh, lifelong surveillance, I think, is part of, part of the deal. And obviously, uh, anything that goes wrong with implants needs to be reported. Uh, in Australia, legislation has just passed uh, where any implant complication, there's now mandatory reporting uh, either by the, in, the manufacturer, the clinician, or in fact, the portal for patients. That's all being set up now. So the law's passed, but of course, the mechanics of how that happens is going to be interesting. Uh, but I think 
we need good data, right? Because if implants are failing and causing harm, then we need to know about it. We need to know about that sooner rather than later. Um, this is the informed educated consent checklist. So once again, thanks to all the collaborators. It was a group effort supported by our state government. Uh, and um, I'm sure uh, Danielle and Terry can send the link out uh, to, to your viewers. So it, it'd be good to, um, to use that. Even if you could take it into your consult anywhere in the world, it's a, it's a really good way of, and guess what? It, it talks about the risk of SSBI right there as a tick box. Um, and look, I think where I want to end is, is, is this slide. It, it's a good slide. It's a slide I showed you, uh, Daniel and Terry, when we, we caught up in, in the US, right? Because I think it, it's an emotive area. I get it, right? I've been researching implants for 20 years. I've been the subject of you know, lawsuits and various claims of fraud, etc. So I, I know that people get very, get very heated about this, this whole space. But, but if we really want to make a difference, right, we need, to, we need to build trust across the various groups that are in this game of implants, right? So obviously there's a role for researchers like myself. There's a role for clinicians like myself. There's a role for industry. There's a role for the regulator. There's a role for patients and advocates. Um, and ultimately it's through collaboration and sharing of good data and science that we will get to a point where we have meaningful answers and more importantly, a way of understanding it and hopefully preventing SSBI from occurring in the first place. I do believe there needs to be a, a transparent declaration of conflicts of interest. I know that's been, uh, there's been a bit of chatter about that. I do believe that we need to think about informed and educated consent for, for breast implants in a more systematic way, set aside all the various agendas. And I know women have, have been hurt and have been harmed and have gone through some significant trauma through, through uh, a lot of their uh, relationship with implants. Um, but I think we have to accept that, but we also have to be in a very slow, systematic way, you know, work forward towards um, some good, good data and evidence. And ultimately, as I've, I've uh, said all along, to be a good doctor, it's not that hard, really. You just got to make sure you look after your patients and put them first. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share this with you and very happy to answer any questions that have, have arisen. Can I ask a question first? Would you mind going back quickly and just um, elaborating a little bit on what should women be doing with screening for their implants? You know, there's kind of, you, you talk about seeing your patients annually. What's the best mm -hmm. or the recommendation for that? So in, in this uh, New South Wales Health uh, um, Toolkit, uh, there is a whole section on surveillance. So, I mean, it, it's probably easier for the cancer patients because they're looking at, you know, breast cancer surveillance anyway, right? So they'll be seeing their oncologist and their breast surgeon and, and uh, the oncology team regularly. Uh, so I think this is more, more important for the cosmetic patients having implants for cosmetic surgery. So there's another paper we just published. Um, it was the paper of the month, I think, at the Aesthetic Surgery Journal Editor's Pick, I think, in the March issue. So once again, if you want copies of that, we'll, we'll try and send them out to you. And that was a really interesting paper because we, we, in Australia, you know, through government partnership, we have opened implant check clinics. We've got two in Sydney and we're hoping to open a few more around the country. And so women with implants can actually walk in and have their implants and their breasts checked. And um, what we found was that, uh, A, you know, more than half the women had no idea what implant they had in them, right? I mean, that's crazy, right? If you're going to have something put in you, you should have all that information available. Um, and uh, about, you know, 15% of women had implants put in overseas for medical tourism, had, you know, nothing, no follow-up after, no, not even seen their surgeon, you know, after the surgery um, for a checkup. And they're, they're also misinformed. They were told if you have implants, you can't have a mammogram. Well, that's absolutely untrue. And it's actually dangerous because you're going to miss breast cancer, you know, after, after the age of 40, all women need to have mammograms and, and screening for breast cancer. So... So, you know, it was really eye opening to me that when you go, go out into the real world, implants are going in, you know, all the time, whether it's Australia, it's overseas, it's, you know, and, and women are not informed and there's nothing, you know, they're just living with these things. And ultimately, you know, as we all know, things do go wrong. So, so to me, um, I, I would like to see you know, it come once again from the surgeon putting the implant in, they've got to take responsibility. And so, once they've informed the woman, educated the woman, and, you know, the decision was hers to proceed, I think the clinician should offer a program of surveillance. Now, it may not be themselves, they might be too busy, but I don't think it's, you can be too busy to spend, you know, 20 minutes every year seeing a, a patient for a regular follow-up. Um, so I think it should be an annual check, physical examination. Within five years of the implant going in, there has to be some sort of imaging, because we know that 
some implants rupture, it's a silent rupture, so you can, everything looks okay, but the implant's actually ruptured uh, on ultrasound or MRI. Um, and then I think past the age of 40, it needs to be a second yearly mammogram and ultrasound, but a yearly physical check. And obviously the door is open for the woman to check her own breasts. And if anything was to change, to come back straight away. So women need to be reminded every year, look, you make sure you check it every month. If you find a lump, pain, swelling, et cetera, you know, you got to, you got to call me straight away. So for me, look, you know, I get data, so I know exactly what my own Capcon rate is. Um, I know, uh, what, uh, implants work well in what women I've actually learned by, by seeing my own results over 23 years now. Uh, and I think it's made me a better and much more humble surgeon. So to me, like it's a no brainer, right? But when I say, oh, you need to see your own, oh, I'm too busy, it cost me money, and then I find a problem, I've got to fix it. I mean, that that's not good enough, right? I think I think that's something that I've, I've been campaigning for for a while, and I think it kind of makes sense. So I'd like to see more clinicians say, okay, I'm going to put an implant in you today. You're going to come back every year, or if you move town or move country, I'll organise, you know, one of my colleagues to take over your surveillance or whatever. So I think that would be, would be good. And of course, uh, we gather data, right? Because hopefully if you come back and something goes wrong, then you report it now and then we get good data on the performance of these devices over time. So to me, the surveillance is, uh, is a key, not just for breast implants, but all of the plants. Does that answer your question, Robin? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> the other thing uh, with reporting, and I know it's different obviously here um, in Australia compared with what happens overseas, I do, you know, as a consumer or a patient, I feel like it's it's tricky because the A, you can barely find where to actually report the adverse events and then the forms are so complex and ridiculous that sometimes it's really hard for, for patients who are not highly health literate and, you know, have medical degrees to put these forms out. No, no, so, absolutely be good if it was easier for us to fill them out. That's a, that's a work in progress, uh, Robin. So, you know, as you know, I sit, sit on some of the advisory boards for the regulator here. So um, legislation has just gone through. Um, and we, I did ask about, you know, making it easier, particularly for consumers and patients to report directly to the regulator. So that's in, in, in process. So um, it, it will become easier. I'm not sure when, but um, I, I'm not, I don't and work you know, anyone in any country can report a, uh, what we call uh, MDR, and we can provide the link uh, in this chat until mm -hmm. until things get more robust in Australia. Like at least it's a it's a database to report all all the different breast implants. You know, from Latin America, Europe, um, Australia, yeah. uh, China, all these places, as well as the U.S. Exactly, and patients can report. Have to get the. Uh... That's a good point. And don't forget the breast device registries as well. So in Australia, we're, we're a little bit ahead of you in the US. It's a very, very valuable resource. And so, you know, going back a few years now, every pretty much every implant going in in Australia, at least, uh, will have an entry into the ABDR. And so if you were to find an adverse event, you should be able to then track the device, when it went in, what it went in for. So, you know, reporting an adverse event, but then not knowing what the implant is or you yeah. know, where it went in. So, um, yes, yeah, so definitely, I think tightening up the registries and getting, you know, longitudinal data and being able to then say, okay, that device went in, that's your device, it's now silently ruptured. Oh, we're seeing a signal with these particular devices that there's a high rupture rate. That should then trigger a regulatory investigation yeah. and then hope. Regarding your imaging for surveillance, like I've started to mm -hmm. use um, MRI breast implant integrity mm -hmm. MRI as, as denoted mm -hmm. by the FDA guidelines, but also uh, Dr. Eduardo Flore is um, I think about to hopefully he's going to publish on how to find silicone induced granulomas on ultrasound. And I know Dr. Fang does that as well. Um, I would like to see the plastic surgery community use that more for surveillance, not just rupture, not just the Linguini sign, not just, you know, uh, Frank, observations, but these other observations that are objective signs on imaging that mm -hmm. show, hey, here's a granuloma, which is an inflammation cascade. And the way he depicts yeah. in the studies he's done to say it's silicone or whatever, a granuloma is still an inflammatory cascade. That plus X plus X will just give us more data. And I don't see that being used as freely. And yet we are still doing the imaging and I think I think we could use some, I don't know, help in pushing. Like this is a great way to do surveillance. If people have symptoms, 
of inflam inflammation, but their markers aren't high enough yet, um, which brings mm -hmm. me to another thought. Um, and then yeah. explant reveals then maybe if removing the inflammatory cascade like the capsule or like that location of where the granuloma is on that capsule, we pay closer attention, blah, 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 maybe the higher percent rate, rate in the drop of symptoms. And then in the functional medicine it, world, oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was going to say that uh, so, uh, MRI, look, it, it's expensive here in Australia. Yeah, so, but we can so do it with ultrasound too. Ultrasound. Uh, so yes, we, yes ultrasound, we use ultrasound as our first screening test. And what I found, uh, just like you say, the, the sonographers and the radiologists that we work with at the implant clinic are really, really good because they see, you know, so many of them yeah. that even subtle, subtle signs are picked up. So, yeah. um, so I think it's a, it's like a learning process, right? You know, so you start implant assessment, you start using ultrasound, the more you use it, the better you get at it. And yeah. then hopefully it becomes learning right so it's exactly as you say but dr. it's got to be done like yeah dr flora has the lexicon maybe we can get them to just connect so he can uh yeah. teach them what he's learned over the past 10 20 years as well exactly um, and what would be really powerful is if we then correlate the ultrasound findings with the histology findings so you know so then that yes. way it's like yeah, yeah, exactly. Then you say, okay, well, then you see this in ultrasound. Oh, look, by the way, when we took the implant out, that's exactly what you said, and here it is. So, oh, and look, we had of... synovial metaplasia. <laughs> and, and, and I wonder if this, you know, but we didn't have synovial yeah. metaplasia in those. We didn't see the granuloma, and oh, that would be exactly. beautiful. Yeah, but that's, yeah. that's the way to actually validate, um, you know, so seeing something on imaging and then confirming that's exactly what we found when we did the surgery. Yeah. That, that's the study, I think. That allows him and to he's um, done that in his single center studies. Yeah. So I think you would be, uh, you'd be intrigued with the the research behind that. So it's going on Definitely. in. Yeah. So in the in the um, what I've learned in my practice is that there's Western medicine ranges for you know CRP, glucose, you know hemoglobin A1C, and then there's the functional yeah. range, right? And so sure. I would be, I would love to know where, I mean, and you just, maybe it's 5% to the left, 5% to the right, or 10 or 10, like, where do they sit, right? Because if you took yeah. women without implants or any implantable devices, including no, you know, no dental implants, and, and you'd looked at this age group for their CRP, then you look yeah. at the CRP with people with no SSBI, no BII symptoms, but want their yes. explant, and what, how do they fall? compared to those with symptoms. And they might not have hit these markers yet. They might not have hit high CRP or high ANA or, you know, um, oh. yeah. homocysteine and things like that. But it would be it would be interesting to see the trend, you know, are they pre-inflammatory markers? And then, I mean, like you were talking about, uh, there's so many inflammatory markers that we don't look at and it's really hard to look at them all, but I'd love to see exactly. that. Exactly. I think that's a good point, Danielle. So I think it's one of those things where we either look at continue to use CRP, which I think is not a, is a blunt instrument. Like, it, you know, there's so many things that raise your CRP and then people can always argue, oh, well, it could be this, it could be that. Or we look at technology that's a little bit more specific. And so that's why actually at Macquarie University where I am today, there's a huge proteomics lab. And so we've started yeah. to talk to them about collaboration. Uh, and they're very confident that they can um, they can pick up low levels of systemic you know inflammation and things like that using uh, proteomics. So, well, so but we, you know, those, those studies are expensive, right? So then, oh, then I know, but chicken. we can we can, <laughs> yeah. we can look at interleukins now. You know, we can look at um, yeah. Absolutely. There's uh, Cyrex laboratories can do you know a lymphocyte panel and and look to see, they'll use uh, helper cells, TH1, TH2, TH6. Sure. Oh, look, you, you can do a whole heap of uh, immunological, even, you know, um, I'm breaking out in hives because I'm like, yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and, but but the, the two things is that to do it at scale, right, requires number one, patience, right, and, and signing up for the study and, and giving us samples. And number number two requires you know money and funding. So they're things that you know constantly with research you could do a whole heap of really exciting things. But at the end of the day, you know you need to secure the grants and you know build the case. And so I think 
I think with with ALCL there was like a much more urgency because this was cancer, but I think we're starting to build a case that there is some good uh, data and evidence gathering. And so you build slowly, build. It's a slow process. So people want answers tomorrow. But it's been but, sixty but, years. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I I can't. I it's it's too slow. I understand yeah, where we're today, I get that. which is better than yeah. before. But in 1979 and 1995, we I can show you the papers that said, look, look at the immune cascade to a foreign body, right? And sure. so here, it, it's almost like Groundhog's Day, but I wasn't there. I've just read the thousand plus publication, sure. right? And yeah, albeit they've been small, but they've been giving clues since 1979 and before of what's been happening. So I have of less course. patience, you know, yeah. waiting. Like I'm so hungry for this data. We're so hungry for this data, yeah. right? Absolutely. And yeah. so- Absolutely. No, I, I, completely, I completely get it. But I think to, to and, and there's a mountain of stuff that's been published, absolutely. And I've, I've looked through the same papers that you have. The opportunity we have right now is that, um, you know, there, there is now some evidence pointing us in a particular direction. So I think we, we need to finish it, right? You know, the reason why it's been going like this for such a long time is that there hasn't been this cross collaboration. There haven't been people, you know, going, actually, you know what, we really need to look at this in depth. It's, it's been to the margins, whereas now suddenly the regulators talking about it. You know, there are people like me that, you know, 20 years of uh, research track record into implant safety. They go, actually, you know what, I think there's, there's something here we need to, we need to at least look here. Yeah. Look oh, I'm grateful and it's going yeah. But and it's got to be done in a systematic way, you know, so that you build on evidence and evidence and evidence to a point where it, it's just, it's irrefutable, right? And you might say the evidence is there now. Um, well, I think the I mean, evidence to prove that silicone is not inert is there. I think there's specific evidence that shows that there's gel bleed that happens, the manufacturers say that, and rupture that happens. So we now know sure. that we have free silicone in the body. And so what are we going to do with, about that, right? What are we going to yeah. do with the women who have all these things, whether or not um, what comes from the day? that um, implants are not biocompatible to the body. Well, we don't, we don't have that information, right? right? So, so it feels very strange for over 60 yeah. years, having these devices put in women and men and yeah you know, just beings, and then they say, okay, they're safe. And now we learn that these same products are causing cancer, not cancer, cancers. Yeah. And we don't know sure. how many cancers are occurring. And we don't know what the percentage is because we haven't tracked these implantable devices. We don't have the registries. Exactly. We don't have the things. Have the but when you're putting in a device that can cause X, even at 1% or 2%, you're putting in a device that causes harm. Certainly Absolutely. that in the very yeah. least should be informed consent to, to the person. Absolutely. The product. I agree. I agree hundred percent because if it was me, right. You know, as long as I was informed about that, and as long as there was some sort of program of follow-up and surveillance, the decision whether to accept 1% or not is not, is mine. Yeah. It's my decision. Right. You know, and I are say, you okay, okay, with without getting implants, cancer, are you okay yeah, with getting exactly, systemic exactly, illness? Are exactly, okay exactly. And, and everyone has a different level of acceptance yeah. of risk. So, so I, I don't think it should be made for the patient. It should be made no. by the patient, right? You know, but it's been so, sixty so, years of not having that. But yeah, I don't exactly. want to digress. I know there's questions in the chat, but one other comment that was big for me. I do, I do. It's just on an hour, so I just, oh. I, I probably have another five minutes, and so okay. I, then I have to. Great. Another call, the, so. the, there should be a, a, a way to score when there's a, a, and I don't know the psychological term, but when you're feeling like death and then you don't mm -hmm. feel like death anymore, my, <laughs> my right. five, I couldn't live. You give a woman a, a breath of fresh air, that five is still, yeah. could still be a five, but it's going to feel like a one for some time. And so I think oh, the starting look at that. Yeah. So yeah. No. we have questions. Exactly. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. There, I so don't no, see I, any. I, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, no, go ahead. It, no, I was going to say that the, the starting point is really important. That's a really important point. So when we're looking at the six and 12 month data, Robin and I have talked about it. You don't want to look at the whole group. You want to look at, you know, what's happened to individual women and then do the 
comparison because and then you're starting your, from it'll yeah. be interesting yeah. if how they how they uh like you might see it go up but that doesn't mean the explant failed it might be like they're leveling leveling out and i think we missed that a lot in a lot of the data points so i suspect exactly. because i see them after like three mm. six months and they're, they're starting to be like oh i thought i was feeling well and i do feel better but i'm still off and then we work on yeah. things right so yeah, yeah, there's no, there's not really a question, but there's a comment. So um, the comment is changing the name is not taking responsibility is actually more dismissing and undermining the BII community and the doctors who have been studying BII and writing publications using that name, hence Groundhog's Day. Yeah, yeah, look, I think, I, but once again, that's a valid point. And it's, we're not, I'm not changing a name, I'm just using a more accurate term. So the BII still exists, we're not trying to deny it or whatever. And I, I said to you, that's not, that's not the aim. But as we collect more data, and as we collect more scientific data, and as we get into higher and higher level journals and publications, it's about scientific credibility and accuracy. So that that's, that's the reason. So I think, um, it's not out of any any subterfuge or any sort of aim of minimizing this. But, but once again, putting my research hat on, putting my academic hat on, putting my funding hat on, putting my regulatory, you know, not my regulatory hat, but speaking to the regulators and making things happen, it needs to move into a more um, accurate uh, accurate terminology. Same with the on block versus the total capsulectomy. So just using the right terminology, but doesn't doesn't say BI doesn't exist and doesn't deny it at all in fact it makes it stronger so but I understand there's some misgivings out there and and absolutely you know acknowledge that there's no but there's nothing uh, sinister about it you know so ho hopefully that puts some minds at rest I know it won't put everyone's mind at rest but at least that's where I'm, that's where we're well, coming from I totally thank you for both uh Robin I know you're a bit of an instigator for all of this and the Denver <laughs> selector and Dr. Diva, I'm, yeah. I'm real thrilled that you are uh, you are screening and doing surveillance for those who have breast implants and then also welcoming them to explant uh, should that be their choice and necessary for them or a desire just to explant. I love that you have sure. the data comparing both. And I, and I absolutely love that the, the women who just decide to explant because they're just done with their implants feel better after explant. I love that. Yes, that's interesting. <laughs> Me, yeah. too. Well, Me too. That's my favorite. That's, that's, uh, that's data talking to you, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to deny. Like, you know, when, when you have data like that, uh, you know, I'm very happy to debate anyone on this data, right? Because it, data yeah. is data. You can't, the numbers are the numbers. So um, uh, it's always a position of strength. So that's what I think, you know, once again, I understand there's a lot of chatter and a lot of, you know, fear and anxiety out there. Absolutely acknowledge that. I don't want to deny it. But what we're trying to do here is to is to put a structure and a path forward such that you're not waiting another 60 years for, for something. Oh. Like that. <laughs> next and week, that we'll note. have the information next week. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> just thank All you right. for your time. And we My look pleasure. forward to seeing you again. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye.